Hi, everyone. Welcome back from your break. Um, yeah, we're excited to get started with session two. Um, thank you for having me. I'm so pleased to be here to be able to briefly introduce uh, this ongoing social enterprise pro uh, art project uh, to an academic arena, um, demonstrating a practical outcome, perhaps, for the ideas that we're discussing here today. I'm here on behalf of Love Welcomes and the textile artist Margot Selby, now a trustee. Love Welcomes is a social enterprise working with refugee women to build long-term in income-generating skills. It was founded by Abby Hewitt in 2017 in response to the refugee crisis and initially operated in camps in Greece, primarily with Syrian refugees. Amongst the initial objectives was to provide women who were often traumatised and vulnerable with something to do in the camps that can be boring as well as chaotic bringing some routine and structure to disrupted lives, <coughs> enabling opportunities to socialise and build new communities, and crucially, to earn money, and therefore regain autonomy. It was conceived as a work-based programme. Abby quickly realised that in order to realise these aims, the women wanted to be engaged in a creative activity specifically, and they themselves directed the project towards weaving. Having had no experience of weaving herself, Abby engaged local weavers and set up a weaving studio from scratch. Abby then approached weaver artist Margot Selby for advice on design and product development. And in 2019, Margot traveled out to the Ritzona camp north of Athens to help with the project. She joined the workshops um, teaching women skills how to wind a warp and set up the looms and weave. Together, they developed designs for a range of products cushions, mats, purses that were sold through the Love Welcomes website to raise funds, all going directly to the makers. The materials available at Ritzona included salvaged blankets and life jackets. These were cut into strips and incorporated into the weaving. The bright seams of orange amongst the soft greys reverberate with, with symbolism. Not only did these designs repurpose material through necessity, making use of existing fabric when new yarn is in short supply, they reclaim an ordeal. The discarded life jacket has served its purpose and borne its wearer to safety, at least temporarily. The sight of them around the camps in piles, both incongruous and disturbing. They allowed in color, not for aesthetics, but for urgent visibility, for survival, in this new context, embedded and enmeshed as they are in the fabric of these women's work, they represent the processing and remembrance of an experience, an extraordinary adaptation, and a tribute to lives saved and lost. The warp is a fine cotton, but the weft is of varying chunkiness, giving the fabric a distinct stratified structure. Each element is hand-placed and positioned. The structure is dense, yet tactile and soft. Love Welcomes now has a permanent headquarters in Greenwich in London and continues its work with refugee women of all origins settled there. In February 2022, Margot ran a week-long patchworking workshop to design and make the first patchwork art blankets with Love Welcomes employees. Nine different countries are represented in the first cohort of makers. 
Margot has donated a, size a sizable store of fabric remnants. As well as being a weaver and artist, she leads the Margot Selby studio, designing woven textiles for interiors applications, products and apparel, working with big UK brands such as John Lewis, Habitat and Hillary's, as well as bespoke um, projects with designers. And production continually generates offcuts. Rather than wastage, these are considered precious and have been previously sold from the studio for domestic crafting and small-scale upholstery projects. For Margot, as well as a desire to contribute, working with Love Welcomes presents an opportunity to preserve this archive creatively as art. I'm going to show you a series of photographs taken to document the first patchwork art blanket workshop. The participating women employed by Love Welcomes uh, will remain anonymous in this presentation, although they have given permission for their images to be shared. I also want to share their words with you, again, anonymized. I left my country by foot. It took me nine days to get to Sudan. From Sudan, I went to Egypt, which took six months. At sea, I went 12 days with no water or food. I was 15. The Italian Coast Guard found us as the boat was not working for three days. The boys could not be patient, so they swam. A few died. The life jacket did not save them. When the waves came, someone tried to save them, but could not. Story told in numbers. This is necessarily an odd juxtaposition, a patchwork of words and pictures, past and present. I am proud of who I am. I am here chasing my dream. I hope to become an interior designer and have my own studio. To learn new skills, to get a job, to have agency creates confidence. My hope is to accomplish an education in the future. Concentrating on my work will help my dreams come true. I want people to know that we are refugees to change our future, to get better jobs and better hopes. They beat me and I was put in hospital. I woke up there not knowing what had happened. If I did not escape, I would not be alive. We are not pests, we can contribute to the community, we have good hearts, we love the UK. When I arrived in the UK I was confused. I wish people would be encouraging and hopeful with refugees and displaced people. Before leaving my home I worked as a 2D and 3D graphic designer. I worked with computer software. Before I arrived, I did fashion design. I'm good with sewing. We would sew dresses and skirts. Getting a job has been my greatest challenge and my greatest joy. It is the thing I am proudest of. Here's a selection of the patchwork art blankets as they are presented online. Each one is a unique composition, color blocks and patterns of various scales are constructed and stitched together with an instinctive freeform approach, my way like G's Bend. The uh, familiar to me Margot Selby designs are filtered through the sensibilities of each maker and a collaborative process. The vibrant colors and geometric patterns take on figurative meanings through my own interpretation. I can't help but see sunshine on the sea and the London Underground motif as representing arrival in the UK capital. That fabric was originally designed by Margot for the London Transport Museum. But I have no idea if these were the deliberate intentions of the makers though, or associations that they made. Perhaps it's kitschy to try and find such little, literal representations 
Actually, the makers are constructing purely abstract relations of colour and form in a modernist mode, perhaps, but even then it is tempting to seek metaphors and narratives. The initial series of 25 blankets sold out within hours of being offered online, with 100% of the profits going to Love Welcomes and the women they support. A second batch is now available through the Love Welcomes website or via Margot Selby Studio. Patchworking as a traditional practice was always for thrift as well as craft, long before the environmental sustainability concerns that are certainly part of Margot's thinking. The 19th century economical adage of waste not, want not, and the World War II slogan, make do and mend, still have resonance. Like most textile art, patchworking is gendered as feminine. Pejoratively, of course, it is housewifely, more so than weaving with its Bauhaus associations or tapestry. It is generally functional, blankets to keep the family warm, motherly, and an expression of love, therefore, again with the metaphors. The quilts made at G's Bend in the US state of Alabama have undergone a remarkable elevation in recent years, appearing in a UK public gallery in 2020 in the exhibition We Will Walk at Turner Contemporary in Margate, near where Margot has her studio, and of course in the show here, What Lies Beneath, we have this remarkable piece by Stella May Petway, following the seminal showcase at Alison Jacques Gallery last year. Despite similarities in aesthetic and approach, the G's Ben style has been a huge influence on Margot as an artist. They are in many ways the opposite of the Love Welcomes patchwork art blankets. Petway's iconic big wheel um, comes out of a community endeavour, a communal practice unique to a geographical location where craft skills and visual sensibilities have been passed down through generations of women. This is the exact opposite of the love welcomes women whose lives have been fragmented and displaced. They have only recently met each other. They speak different languages. They hold different beliefs. They eat different food and have suffered different experiences. The desire to express themselves creatively might be the only thing they have in common. The term art quilting theorises the practice of stitching fabric to fabric, and since second wave feminist artists of the 1970s, it has become a vital and politicised art form. This is a language that on the move global women can speak. We can think of these patchwork art blankets as femages a term invented by Canadian artist Miriam Shapiro to describe her fabric collages and contest the trivialization of women's art. She sought to trace a female genealogy, a lineage of women artists to connect her to modernist mistresses. P and D, as she called it, or pattern and decoration, um, speaks to the blanket, to the dress, to the tent, to the house. The female body is home to the fetus and in turn a woman's place inside the home and without, domestic to the universal. Interior, exterior, turbulence, eviction, displacement and journey. In 1978, she wrote with Melissa Mayer in the seminal essay, Waste Not, Want Not, an inquiry into what women saved and assembled, femage. When it, became, uh, when it becomes possible to appreciate a sewn object like a quilt, even though it was created for utilitarian purposes, then it will be clear that women's art invites a methodology of its own. Women have always collected things and saved and recycled them because leftovers yielded nourishment in new forms. The decorative functional object women made often spoke in a secret language and bore a covert imagery. When we read these images in needlework, in paintings, in quilts, rugs and scrapbooks, we sometimes find a cry for help, sometimes an allusion to a secret political alignment, sometimes a moving symbol about the relationships between men and women. 
We base our interpretations of the layered meanings in these works and what we know of our own lives, a sort of archaeological reconstruction and deciphering. Collected, saved and combined materials represented for such women acts of pride, desperation and necessity. Spiritual survival depended on the harboring of memories. Shapiro herself descended from Russian emigres on both sides, third generation, and related strongly to the modernist constructivist tradition with its many female practitioners. Sonia Deloney, Lubov Popova, Alexandra Exter, Vavara Stepanova all appear in her great work, Fan, Mother Russia. Tracy Emin, of second generation Turkish and Roma descent, has used applique techniques to record her autobiography and inner world in such, such works as Everyone I Have Ever Slept With and many other text based works. Perhaps the last word in making the personal, political, and subversive stitching, to adopt Rosika Parker's terminology. It is earlier works um, by Shapiro such as Anatomy of a Kimono, that the patchwork art blankets most recall, with their subtler, more abstract, more ambivalent discourse. The sewing circle is a space for women to work together creatively and share their stories. Refugee women have remarkable tales to tell. The rich eclecticism of the compositions created in the Love Welcomes workshop represent the personalities, experiences, and journeys of women, however tangentially. Patchworking is a process of piecing things together. And this is from Abby Hewitt. Short quote. <laughs> I'll leave it unread. Okay, thank you. There are a few slides here you didn't show, Lucy. Just trying to. Are you going away? Am I? Oh, maybe I am. No. That's the end of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I don't quite know. Yeah, I can't find my beginning. Well, great thing. I'll just introduce myself. I'm Zoe Quick. Um, I'm hot off the road from Mid Wales, and I'm really excited to be here because this is actually the first in-person event I've done in two years or since the pandemic started. A little daunted too, I should say. <laughs> um, there's nobody with a mask on, which is quite weird for me, having come from Wales. Um, and before I, I start, I just wanted to say thank you to, to the organisers for inviting me and to um, the many really brilliant uh, participants who've engaged in my research who are, who are included in the presentation but didn't want to be named but they know who they are. Just click. Click on that one for the next one. Okay. And then it's just the arrow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I said, I've just come from Wales, which is where I live, and I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the Welsh landscape today um, and a pair of funeral stockings. So in the wake of Brexit, and as climate change progresses, the Welsh upland communities face multiple losses of livelihood, land, culture, and a language which is rooted in sheep farming. Where Brexit has been widely recognised as posing a threat to, to Welsh sheep farmers, it's been identified as an opportunity by rewilders, precipitating a polarised debate between farming and rewilding. It's from the my glasses. <laughs> which has been shown by research at Bangor University to be underpinned by issues of identity. And here, my attention has turned to the image of Welshness as a woman in national dress and the politics of loss at play and the apparent paradox that, as the historian Deirdre Beddow has pointed out, Welsh women are culturally invisible. And as an incomer to Wales, um, an English incomer, I should say, I seek to situate myself ethically in relation to these images um, and to the Welsh upland landscape where I now live and to understand how such images might connect to hiraith, which is a Welsh word meaning something like yearning for home. Because I note that the feminist scholar Bridotti, Rosie Bridotti, recognises that yearning is an effective political sensibility 
that cuts across boundaries and could be fertile ground for the construction of empathy. Mindful that Braidotti emphasizes thinking about process, I become really intrigued by the number of these images in which women are knitting stockings. I'm really struck then when I come across the unlikely survival of a pair of 19th century Sanai Anglav burial stockings, which are held at Caradigion Museum, which is near to where I live. They somehow seem to epitomize the loss in the images of invisible Welsh women. So I decide to explore how re-knitting these stockings might act towards remembering, in all senses, these women, and how it might inform questions of identity and loss in the uplands today. And following Braidotti, for whom remembering is creative reworking, accounting backward for the effective impact of data on oneself, I'm presenting this paper as a kind of reflective narration of my re-knitting research. And it's turned out to be a much, much longer process than I'd first imagined. So I should just warn you that this is a story which is on the pins, and knitters will know that means work in progress. So according to Caradigio Museum, Nelly knitted her stockings in the 19th century at a time when the Welsh upland economy was floundering. Although a family wage had been introduced as a means to position women as dependents, the agricultural labourer's wage, wage was insufficient to support a family. Forced to take any opportunity for piecemeal work, women came to glean wool from rocks and hedges in little scraps, spinning and knitting them into stockings to sell. And this was in between their daily chores. They knitted along paths and around hearths, supporting each other in their craft, and saved many families from starvation. These wild-ish, wandering women embodied a political challenge to 19th century British progress and agricultural improvement, suggesting why they might have been, become an image of Welsh resistance. Transforming Welsh upland wastes into saleable products, they were arguably transgressive and revolutionary, their reproduction threatening. A wool waste today manifests very differently in the uplands. Last year, a fleece would fetch only 30 pence on the market and cost about five pounds for the farmer to shear. So most farmers think of all their wool as waste. And it isn't difficult to persuade a local farmer to give me a fleece or two in return for helping at shearing. So in between rolling fleeces, as I document the process on film, my lens settles on one ewe. I watch as she stands, one-eyed, waiting for the shearer's shutter to open. She's a Welsh hill speckle-faced, a Davad Penvrith, a breed that originated near this farm in 1880s, so she's about as local as you can get. At the end of the day, I find a small pile of rolled black fleeces behind the shearing trailer, undiable waste, separated from the white. Black speckled sheep are throwbacks to the original Soe ancestors. They're thought to have arrived in Britain with Neolithic settlers. And this is also how the white speckled sheep get their dark speckles. I reflect on the fact that Welsh is speckled with the word breath, a word that in turn is speckled with meanings. Mottled, pied, but also imperfect, poor, base, vile, degenerate, shady, dubious. I look at my photocopied photographs of stocking knitters and my eye is drawn to one in particular. She is Penbreath, speckle-faced. Peering through a contaminated film of history, she stands one-eyed, waiting for the photographer's shutter to close. I note that my local wool bears the speckles of other places, other times, and that from speckled ewes and a speckled history, I'm spinning a speckled line. In the late 19th century, the Welsh photographer John Thomas took over 100 portraits of women in Welsh costume. Most of them were knitting. If we see their ankles, their stockings are white, Sanai Pach, respectable stockings, but mostly their dark skirts conceal the fact that most pe peasant women at this time wore footless stockings, which were more practical for those who had no shoes. If this makes it all the more striking that a woman would dedicate precious time to knit and preserve a pair of stockings just for her own laying out, it also raises questions about popular attitudes to respectability, particularly in the light of the fact that footless stockings in Welsh were called Sanai Pengast, literally stockings of the harlot, the whore. Depicted, they're depicted here in this map of North Wales as a woman. And here this suggests an ambivalence about mobility and morality in women who were, in the 19th century, the focus of violent accusations of immorality by the English. Arguably, John Thomas's photographs were part of a campaign on the part of the Welsh to give women a respectable framing. 
but his own nonconformism and resistance to English suppression of the Welsh culture conspired in an illusion. For these images are taken outside for better lighting. Yet the women are somehow captured in the imagined interior of a crudely painted classical backdrop, wearing a costume that's been borrowed from the photographer. It also seems significant that at a time when the clicking of needles would only stop at the chapel gate out of respect for sacred ground, these women's fingers would have to hold still for John Thomas's camera. In fact, these women could knit at about 200 stitches per minute thanks to a knitting sheath they just tucked into their apron strings, which had left one hand free to work. It's at this point I have to declare myself complicit in another filmic illusion, because in autumn 2020, I agreed, probably in a silly way, to, to be interviewed on Welsh television, demonstrated stocking knitting on four needles while walking. I'd never done it before. Um, <laughs> so I found myself rushing to knit the first rounds of a stocking on some non-native alpaca, thinking the camera wouldn't know the difference. And with a sort of spongy scented stick as a, an improvised sheath, I tried knitting while walking and found my stitches painfully slow. When the programme aired, I was really grateful for the slow-mo edit, but not really for the ways my words that had been spliced and edited. When I watched the programme, I also found that I was preceded by an older woman handling Nellie Evans' funeral stockings as she recounted memories of her mother laying out the dead. The juxtaposition of anecdote and stockings suggested convincingly that knitted in names are an indicator of burial stockings. I later found this confirmed by an academic paper, but this paper also emphasised that there can be no certainty without provenance, and that given Nellie Evans' stockings were bought at auction, their status as burial stockings is uncertain. So what exactly is it that I'm knitting with my speckled yarns? On the question excuse me, of faithfulness to the original, Braidotti says the focus is not on accuracy, but effective traces, what's left over, what remains, and what has somehow caught and stuck around. This seems curiously apt for a stocking made of wastes that is the stuff of nostalgia anecdote and a series of filmic reproductions. I come to think of Nellie's name not as an indicator or in terms of provenance, but in terms of its effective charge as a trace. Because admittedly, it was the knitted name that first drew me in. Welsh surnames relate to bloodlines rather than place names or occupations and to the importance of breeding and pedigree in ancient culture, Welsh culture. They bear the trace of a patronymic naming system that charted a genealogy of the male line, closely linked to patriarchal patterns of land ownership. Yet by the 19th century, in the wake of enclosures, the majority of Welsh farmers were tenants, their family name the last thread of currency that bonded them to the land. So for the Evans name to be buried in the soil would have held great significance. And I'm minded of a question often asked by the older generation around my area. Oes na i the nuam eto? Do they have a stone here yet? It refers to gravestones and loss in a sense that the more stones you have, the more love you've interred in the ground, the deeper your belonging. I think of the Welsh surnames on such stones and my own name, and then I feel an outsider. I think of Nellie's nameless sisters. These women had no right to land or to a name except through their fathers and sons, yet they were relied upon for a connection to land, not only through a continuation of a bloodline, but as a preserver of Welsh language in the home. In the 19th century, literacy, morality and motherhood were inextricably linked to land. So while it's no surprise that Nellie could knit her own name, the lines she draws with her red yarn are not the same as the red lines used on maps to claim territory. And significantly, this is a map of the um, land claimed by a rewilding project that directly affects the farm where I got the wool. Nora Nellie's yarns are the same as the red lines used to claim, frame, and contain the wildness of women's wandering skirts, even if in the efforts of Welsh resistance. As Bridotti has argued, clashes of civilizations are too often postulated and fought over women's bodies as bearers of authentic ethnic identity. She reminds us of a different subjectivity, a radical unbelonging. The nomad's relationship to the earth is one of transitory attachment, cyclical frequentation. The antithesis of the farmer, the nomad gathers, reaps and exchanges, but does not exploit. For her, the nomad's identity is a map of where she's already been, an inventory of traces. I think of Nellie's stockings made of wool, waste wool gathered, spun, and knitted along paths. She knits an inventory of traces. Her name, her red thread, is not a claim, but a trace. 
that summons a network of relations and struggles and contradictions. Nanny's name is knitted, I suspect, with second-hand repurposed red yarn. So I frogged an old red jumper. And then I pause, a little daunted, with a jumble of questions and emotions about knitting a name into these stockings. For a start, Bridotti has an awful lot to say about my own name. Zoe, Bridotti says, as vitalistic, pre-human and generative life, summons a rethinking of mortality as dynamic principle, life and death as non-binary. Bridotti's Zoe calls us to cultivate endurance, death in life, gently and productively. I don't think my parents had any of this in mind when they named me, by the way. <laughs> so I think of Nellie knitting along paths and around a shared hearth, knitting land and kin into her death and death into life. I think of the Gwilnos, the wake in 19th century Wales, which, rather than an occasion for mourning, was a lively affirmation of kinship towards a member of the community held around the hearth of the deceased. As Bridotti argues, self-styling one's death is an act of affirmation. And ethically, we need to locate compassion and care of others in this frame. Importantly here, she redefines kinship and ownership so as to rethink links of affectivity and responsibility for multi-species others. I ponder blood and kinship. As I watch back a film of me rolling fleeces at the farm, I remember finding my hand blood-speckled and feeling momentarily uncertain as to whether the blood was that of my own or of a you. I think of Bridotti's assemblages, Donna Haraway's multi-species string figures, and of Aldo Leopold's notion that land is multi-species community. To me, they all seem to be about knitting kin, kin knitting, not through breeding, but through effect, care, the vectors of desire. The agency of wool in this process becomes clear when I sit on a pavement spinning on market day in Aberystwyth. A diverse community of locals are drawn to my baskets of wool, both washed and raw, smelly in the grease, countless touching, feeling fingers, dogs' noses sniffing. My wheel reels them into conversation, and people tell me stories about sheep, what they're wearing, their memories, loss and land. Following the sociality of 19th century stocking knitting, I also run a series of workshops with young people. They're new to knitting and spinning and find these processes awkward, difficult. I think of the embodied memory held in the curl of a 19th century stocking knitter's hand, of skills passed between fingers across generations. As I try to trace the stitch Nellie knitted into the body of her stocking, I wonder how she picked up patterns and stitches. Perhaps for her, a stocking was a form of effective tactile, tactile text, but I cannot read this stitch. An academic paper records it as feather and fan, a stitch closely related to old shale and shell stitch, all of which traveled from the continent to Shetland before birthing on Welsh shores. I reflect that this stitch has been passed on through imitation, variation, conversation, and not only between generations of clicking fingers, but in a relay between species. So the craft of these apparently wild, wandering women is not anarchic, but skillfully negotiated in community, in communion with multi-species others, with land. It calls for the kind of outward-bound ethical disidentification, which for Bridotti involves a qualitative shift of our collective imaginings and a shared desire for transformation, not to preserve, but to change. And this has clear implications for the future of the British uplands. As I knit and spin, I pay attention to patterns of change, the knitting together, of beginnings and endings. As I watch the sun set over the sea at Aberystwyth, the shimmering patterns of light and dark, of presence and absence at the edges of change, I suddenly understand why the texture of water is described in the local vernacular as sanai ayer, golden stockings. Just as sea becomes stitch becomes sea, Nellie and I are a verb, a process, a knitting. We're a traveling, shimmering stitch. Thanks very much. delighted to be here today and I want to say thank you to Annie and to Francesca for organizing such an exciting day of thought-provoking presentations. Today I'll be presenting my paper Crafting Cultural Heritage, Women's Weaving at Egypt's Wisa Wasif Art Center. There are so many things that I wanted to share with you today but I will introduce you to some of my ideas on this subject in a concise form. 
A young woman emerges from a narrow path carrying a tapestry that appears much larger than her. She beckons her friend Tahaya to help her carry it. Tahaya follows her up to a balcony where they pull either end of the tapestry to reveal a dazzling landscape with bright, colorful flowers and vivid green foliage set against a sand-colored sky. They sing and delight in this presentation to their friends, colleagues, and mentor, Suzanne Wiesa Walsif, following long months of work, in this case, eight months. The director of the art center, Ekram Nushi, asks someone to trade places with her so that Neglet can see the results of her own work. The completion of a tapestry at the Wiesa Walsif Art Center is a family affair, as everyone gathers to admire each finished work. To the right of this, in a tapestry by Tahaya Ibrahim, a delightful scene of farmers harvesting is depicted in a vast geometric landscape that bears ripe fruit and features various birds flying throughout the tapestry's flowing sky. The colorful tapestries of the Wisa Wasif Art Center in Haraniya weave a manifold story, employing a distinctive vernacular visual language, vibrant landscapes, and bright, compelling narratives are spun at once spontaneous and visionary. In regarding the scene from the Ramsis Wisa Wasif Art Center and examining the details of its tapestries, a number of questions emerge around their conception. How do these tapestries come to be? Who designs them and how are they made? What is the source of the shared visual language in each of them? Who are these artists and what is it they are expressing? Ramsis Wisa Wasif was an Egyptian architect, professor of art and architecture at the College of Fine Arts in Cairo and the founder of the Ramsis Wisa Wasif Art Center. Born in 1919 in Cairo to a Coptic Egyptian family, Wasif's father was a lawyer and politician who was an influential member of Egypt's nationalist Weft Party and a patron of the arts. Known to his family as an artist, Ramsis Wisa Wasif wanted to be a sculptor and instead persuaded by his father studied architecture at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris Wasif was lecturer and then head of department at the College of Fine Arts in Cairo. He practiced architecture in a manner that was considered a radical departure from his training in mainstream contemporary Western architectural ideas. Together with his wife, Sophie Habib Georgi, they founded the Ramsis Wisa Wasif Art Center. An artist and an educator, Sophie was born in Egypt in 1922, the daughter of Habib Georgi, a celebrated artist and a teacher whose theories played a revolutionary role in arts education in Egypt. The center was established in 1952 in Haraneya, a village south of Cairo. Wasif's principal goal was to train a new generation of children in a dying craft to preserve cultural memory in a time of increasing industrialization. Haraneya was chosen as a location, as an agricultural village with no existing traditions of craft, for the experiment to succeed or fail on its own merits. Children were not screened for potential talent, and rather than being selected, the first generation of weavers were drawn to the Wasifs out of curiosity and a desire to learn and play. Children were compensated for their work to learn its value. Wasif established three guiding principles in place to this day. No assignments in terms of what to depict or draw to rely solely on their imaginations. Not to expose them to art or artistic works so as not to introduce visual references and no criticism of any kind so as not to discourage creativity and experimentation. Progress is made through trial and error, and each weaver learns technical principles on their own terms and at their own pace. This excerpt from the film Art Studio in the Village shows Ramsis Wisa Wasif and Sophie Habib Georgi at the center with the first generation of weavers in 1973. Designed by Ramsis Wisa Wasif, the center itself, along with its landscape, remarkably makes its way into brightly colored tapestries. The center is sustainable by design with all materials locally sourced, including sheep wool, Egyptian cotton for warp, and natural vegetable dyes cultivated at the center itself. A family affair, Wasif's experiment continues through the second generation of weavers, led by his daughter, Suzanne, and her husband, Ikram Nushi. Ramsis Wisa Wasif was posthumously awarded the prestigious Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 1983. The awarding committee described the that the center won the award for the beauty of its execution, the high value of its objectives, and the power of its influence as an example, particularly noting that young tapestry weavers of the community have been free to develop an artistic handcraft, producing tapestries of great excellence and renown. 
At the center, women weave alongside men. However, women outnumber men in both the first and second generations for the attractive opportunity that this craft offers young girls who don't have many opportunities to develop independent practices in the village, as well as the flexible nature of this work that allows them to go home to support their families at home and grow through their careers as daughters, sisters, mothers, and artists simultaneously. Taught to weave intuitively without sketching or prior planning, Wasif sought to inspire an impulsive, expressive discourse positing children's soulful artistic expression as more elevated than what he called pure art produced by modern artists. Tapestries from the Wisa Wasif Art Center are often referred to as such, or as tapestries from Egypt, praised for their depictions of an Egyptian cultural imaginary and seen collectively as part of Wasif's experiment and an extension of his own practice. In the sparse scholarship on the subject, there have been nods to the importance of individual artists without articulating these individuals' practices nor examining their respective bodies of work. I argue that there is value in regarding the collective experiment as well as considering each artist's independent practice for the insightful nuances and significant details that can allow for a deeper and more engaged reading of works. Only master weaver Ali Salim remains from the first gen... Sorry, guys. <laughs> Only master weaver Ali Salim remains from the first generation of weavers, the rest of whom have either passed away or retired. 74 years old, Ali joined the center when he was eight in 1958. In this short clip, Naglet Farouk can be seen weaving a new tapestry. She describes a conversation about her process in which her mother offers advice to include more plants alongside the dry cacti on her loom. She sees small plants in a tapestry at home and decides to include them. One of only a few legacies, Naglet's mother, Galia, was a first-generation weaver afflicted with Alzheimer's, and Naglet had these conversations with her to keep her company, thinking through ideas in the same way that she did with Suzanne Wasif and Ikram Nasihi at the center. Naglet's tapestries depict blossoming Egyptian landscapes and demonstrate a distinctive palette and stylized forms in which small plants become jungles. Learning about her individual practice, compositional decisions become a reflection of her personal expression. These images depict the first generation of women weavers. Fatma Awad is pictured here at her loom at the age of 15. In this film, the women of the Wisa Wasif Art Center are described in Arabic as al azifin ala al-anwal, which translates to the players of the looms, likening the loom to a musical instrument. A fitting description, considering the rhythmic qualities of their compositions, and what Wasif described as an ability to express a feeling with an intense poetic skill. Samir. A fresh tapestry of sunflowers is hung out to be admired, and around this, people can be seen cultivating plants and harvesting. Wool is dyed in large pots of bright red and yellow, cooking and soaking in a picturesque landscape of date palms with birds flying ahead. These scenes depict the process of the dyeing of the wool at the art center, a process that the weavers share together in what they refer to as a festival of colors. Plants are cultivated for vegetable dyes, the seeds of which Ramsis Wisa Wasif planted himself. Reseda for yellow, Garance for red brick, and Cochinelle for pink. Only four tapestries of this subject exist, created in different times by various weavers. Considered significant, these compositions can be regarded as a historicizing exercise, preserved in the center's own collection, with the exception of Rida Ahmed's wool coloring that is in the collection of the Barjil Art Foundation in Sharjah. Though each of these works depicts the same subject and draws from the art center itself, they are vastly different, with different colors, compositions, characters, and scenes. Similarly, in this tapestry, in the collection of the Barjil Art Foundation, Nadia Muhammad depicts a scene of palms and fields, weaving a scene from the center's immediate surroundings. In it, the details of four different figures can be seen under towering palms beside bright blue water accented by vivid red dates. Beyond craft, the women of the Wisa Wasif Art Center weave the landscapes of their surroundings and scenes of daily life, colored with what artist and writer Itil Adnan described as volcanic references to Coptic and Islamic heritage, crafting and preserving cultural memory. 
Tapestries from the school have been exhibited widely since the 1950s, demonstrating a significant practice that defies classification. To conclude, I want to point to Karima Ali's practice for an example of the importance of considering the individual artist weaver. Karima is known for her tapestries that often include horses and folk references, such as a scene of men on horses inspired by the Arab epic hero, Abu Zayd al-Hilali. One day, Karima went to Suzanne Wisa Wasif and told her that she was going to stop weaving. She had just discovered that her husband left her and her children and married another woman. And devastated, she did not want to work. Suzanne convinced her not to neglect her livelihood and instead encouraged her to come up with a tapestry to weave in which she could release her negative emotions. Together, they selected a suitable subject. It took Karima a year to complete the tapestry with only a subject in mind and no fixed ideas, its narrative evolving as she progressed. She began with a tense battle scene where entangled men on horses are engaged in fighting, baring teeth and expressing attention fraught with deep hues and piercing expressions. She decides to add a body of water which allows the horses a moment of reprieve. The composition too begins to breathe and the tension starts to dissipate. She depicts a sunset and the horses begin to fly towards the sky, sun rays dancing and melting into clouds. War on horseback presents a deeply personal subject rendered in the visual language of an Egyptian cultural reference. Karima demonstrates that crafting cultural heritage can stem from a deeply personal pursuit what Ramses described as an inexhaustible flood of invention, sincere reflections of the weaver's state of mind. And I leave you with some suggestions for further reading and a note that the most of the images in my presentation today are courtesy of the Ramses Wieselbosov Art Center. Great, thank you all so much for that really interesting selection of papers. Um, do we have any questions from anyone in the room to start with? Yes. Um, thank you all. I found that whole session very moving and actually quite emotional, the juxtaposition of the different papers. I have a specific question um, for you, Zoe. Um, I think you you used a phrase kin knitting, and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that because it intrigued me. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, I did say kin knitting, um, and I'm always up for a bit of wordplay. Um, I think, and I should say actually that that is part of my practice as well. I kind of the oral the relationship between the oral. Um, culture and, and the textile culture that I'm looking at is so inextricably linked that, that playing with language, I mean, I haven't had time to explore it in 15 minutes a day, but looking at translation between English and Welsh and other languages too is all part of it. Um, it, was a pl it was playful. It was about... Can you oh, sorry, I'm not just make sure that you're... <laughs> you're talking here. Is that better? <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been in the real world. Um, yes, I mean, I think um, at the moment that that play on words was, was relating to the ideas of kin, which Donna Haraway talks about, which uh, Rosie Bradotti talks about, um, something which is not just about a kind of a direct bloodline, a human genealogy, but something which knits us together with other species. Um, so that's a term I think, I, it's funny, I find writing as part of my practice too, and when you start to write and start to look at words on the page, almost like stitches actually on the page, they, they start to make patterns. Um, and that all feels just really relevant to the kind of practice that I'm doing at the moment, um, particularly knitting stitches and charts just look like text in such a sort of real way. So um, it's about reading into that now. It's almost, I, I put that presentation together, I've got the text and I'm going to read back into to some of the words that I've written. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of, it's a beginning of something, perhaps that phrase, rather than a whole concept or, or a neologism that I've come up with. <laughs> Thank you. much it was uh, a very inspiring <laughs> sorry I have to 
to maybe sit down. Um, I have a question to Dr. Catherine Dormor. Thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Um, it's regarding the dresses, the white dresses uh, in the um, performance in Warsaw. Maybe I didn't catch it in your talk, I'm sorry. Uh, do you think these are specific dresses, specific white dresses, or just white dresses? Because uh, they have also a special uh, decoration in the hair. And you also mentioned the uh, Catholic Church. And do you think uh, it could refer, to, or this dress could be referred to a specific ritual in the Catholic Church and uh, religion? Or are they just white dresses? Um, they were designed by one of the one of the participants, so one of the group that organised it, um, and they were, yes, they do reference sort of first communion, wedding, the sort of tradi you know those those traditions where women would wear, wear white dresses, although they are not actually modelled on any particular one. They were they were designed to speak of that purity to cover the sort of ident the individual identi identity to speak of a sort of. Um, I guess a, a sort of a woman rather than an individual in that sense. Um, uh, and um, so, yes, they reference those Catholic practices of, of dressing in white for First Communion and then for wedding particularly. Um, does that answer your question? Um, um, well, obviously, um, generally, First Communion is a, is a, is a young girl um, and um, and the wedding is a young woman um, uh, in the Catholic Church. That, um, but both of them speak of, obviously, purity. And um, you know, the First Communion is um, one of those sacraments about sort of clen cleansing of sin and being filled with God's, God's sort of forgiveness and love and all the rest of it. And the, and the wedding, of course, you're meant to be the virgin before you, before you um, consummate your marriage. So um, it's, there's, a sort of, there's a sort of tying up of that language um, between those two sacraments. But I think we're probably getting into sort of Catholic theology here and um, uh, um, that's someone else's subject. <laughs> As a I mean, it's a really interesting one. And I know that um, obviously with the Catholic Church um, sort of uh, power um, in Poland now, um, having been this sort of resistance body during um, the Cold War um, and before the, the war came down, um, now the country is held in the thrall of the Catholic Church and its teaching. So it's become a very political force, which is, which obviously for women, women's reproductive rights is, is really quite a problem. Not happy. <laughs> I mean, the act went through. Um, they are still pursuing these, the sort of the sort of state right to dictate what women can and can't do um, in terms of abortion, and um, and obviously the Catholic Church has strong teachings um, on um, contraception too. Um, seeing the that you, you have you have sex within marriage and within marriage only and all sex is about um all sexual acts are about procreation with the intention to have children so they are not no they, they weren't they weren't they're not happy about this these acts of resistance which is another reason why the women um are not necessarily identifiable um it's a quite it's quite a dangerous place for women um to protest at the moment they are they're brave brave women um and um you know um, and that's you know it's 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 a tough it's tough times hi um i have a question for nadine um you mentioned in your presentation that the um art center originally was to teach children how to weave um however you showed a bunch like a bunch of older artists do they still um is there like a third generation that is coming into into place at the center? Like, are they still doing like outreach to kids? And like, is it still in that free form, like kids who are curious kind of way? Um, since my impression was that this is a more like well-known art center. So like they might, you know, like I'm thinking of like competitive preschool type of things. Like, is it like that? Or is it still like very chill and like kids can come or do kids even come at all? I mean, um, thank you for your question. It's a very interesting one. 
Uh, right now, the present weavers at the center are the second generation weavers. So those are the women that I was showing you. They grew up as kids in the center and they've kind of developed their practices um, as they aged. Uh, there aren't, there isn't a new generation that I know of, of kids that are going, but it, it remains a kind of open space where people come and go. So a lot of these weavers, you'll see them weaving with their children. They'll be sitting on their lap while they're looming, so uh, while they're weaving on their looms. So it's like um, a kind of really open space in that sense, but there isn't a third generation yet being trained that I know of. Hi, um, I have a question for everyone actually. It would be great to get your perspectives um, on method and how it kind of changed and metamorphosed throughout the process because all of you have taken such beautiful liberties in terms of intertwining memory, personal mem meditation, narrative, political theory, etc. And I just sort of wanna kind of plumb your heads about how you wove all these things together. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, thank you. Um, I think I'm in a, um, a, a different position to my material than other people are maybe because I feel like I'm very much speaking on behalf of uh, Love Welcomes and Margot Selby and I feel like there's a, um, a gap between me and the, the makers um, and of course they're anonymous in my presentation. I I've followed um, the line of love welcomes themselves in, in keeping that anon anonymity. Um, I think it's a it's an interesting issue, um, but for me, I've enjoyed my kind of um, my my distance, the gap between me and, and the subject, because then I I talked in my paper about how um, I can't help but like interpret and find allegorical. Um, meaning and metaphor in in the works and that's something I was kind of playing with and enjoying and I think that um, anonymity of the makers and the problematics of that whatever they are um, it, it, it's um, it, it's always been the case it's often the case with um, women um, working in textiles and I was kind of playing with that so um, I hope that answers your question <laughs> um, but I feel, I feel like I'm in a sort of unique position with my material. But um, Gosh, there's lots of different ways I, I'd answer this question, um, depending on how I'd interpret it. But um, which immediately sets up some really interesting relays between the institution, between the field, capital F, but literally the field in my case. Um, and I think what's really <laughs> What's really been interesting over the past years of, of doing the research, and it has been long partly because of COVID, um, is how things have changed and how I've had to respond to the places where I didn't quite fit in a box. I kind of, my research tends to be across disciplines and um, sort of shuttling between the institution and the field all the time, and, it, and between very diverse um, communities, um, in the uplands particularly, but then sort of academic communities. Um, and I think what I've really been learning is, is what it is to do that shuttling, where, to, to pay attention to the frictions and the difficulties, because those are the places where I learn the most. And for goodness, I've made, made loads of mistakes, and I've taken way too much theory into a workshop with young people on, in a field, you know, and, and they've been kind of, whoa, steady on. Uh, things like that, you know, kind of really important, but, but the ethics of it as well, you know, and I think... Um, I should say also, you know, Nellie Evans would be quite surprised to find her stockings on, on screen. Um, and... There's something, um, I, don't, I probably need to think more carefully about how I say this, but I'm looking very much at the methods of, of, the, of wool gatherers, actually, which is the primary part of my research. Um, they would tell stories. You know, storytelling was a really big part of the work. I, I referred to culture already. So research as a story um, in an accessible way to multiple different audiences is really important, and that's something I'm trying to, to develop. Um, sometimes I sing. I didn't today, but, but that's also part of it. Um, and, and another thing I should mention quickly, I don't want to gobble too much time, is that the last two years have, have been really interesting because I started the research thinking this is going to be really embodied, really material. I'm never going to use PowerPoint. Um, and I started doing presentations around a big banqueting table. I actually do have some things in my bag, which I wasn't sure whether I could bring out um, for people to touch and feel. But, um, 
But actually what happened was I had to move to digital media and to filming myself, which suddenly became a really interesting research method, as I showed today, you know, looking back at films that have been made of me or thinking about how I'll frame what I'm doing becomes a whole practice and a method in itself, which has been really, really useful. Um, I relate a lot to what you're saying about um, making these stories accessible and storytelling and those, the importance of those narratives. And I think in the case of the Wisa Wasif Art Center, um, looking at what has been written about the center and tapestries art historically, um, the authorship of these works is kind of removed in the sense they're looked at collectively as an experiment, as an extension of the architect's practice who set up the center. And um, the, the narratives and the stories that are involved in the practices and the process of creation of each of these works is omitted and it's neglected uh, in terms of um, how these um, works are looked at, if, if they're looked at in any great detail at all. Um, so for me, that's really where um, my approach comes from uh, in terms of the method. Yeah, method. Um, so my, my PhD um, is a practice-based PhD, and I am an artist um, myself, I'm a textile artist. And ev for me, everything does start from the act of working with textiles. Um, and I'm often preoccupied with things like the fa what happens when I cut the fabric with different scissors. I have too many pairs of scissors to mention of different kinds because I'm really fascinated with scissors, with needles, with what happens when you poke the need needle through. Um, I've got some fantastic circular needles. Um, I'm, re I'm really interested in this minutiae when the warp crosses the weft, when the needle goes through, what's happening then and how that can become a language. So, um, um, you know, the, what happens at the frayed edge when the fabric starts to unravel and what can that tell us about the structure and how can that then be become a language that we can talk about the breaking down or the construction of society. Um, so it becomes an activist practice. As I say, this I, I wanted to do something a bit more performative, but this is my only second outing in person since lockdown. I mean, I don't mean second outing, but you know, as a sort of as an as, as giving a paper, and um, uh, it really uh, that performative work takes a bit of sort of working through and getting back into it. So I, I, I went shy today, and I'm really sorry, but um, I'd have loved to have had you all stitching today, but maybe next time. Thank you all so much, everyone, for your, for your questions and to our speakers, for your answers. Um, we'll take another short break now, and we'll reconvene here about uh, 25 past five, so in about 20 minutes, and we have some refreshments outside for you as well, so do please take a short break. <laughs>